So many years ago, Dr. Pepper had a commercial that featured Meatloaf's song, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. And it shows this guy and this girl they're dating, and he's just kind of following her around. She's shopping, he's holding her little girly purse, I would do anything for love, and there he is, it's Dr. Pepper, sipping away. Or they're doing yoga, I would do anything for love, and he's like, oh, this is great, honey, sipping his Dr. Pepper. He's chasing her in the rain. He's outside the umbrella. She's under it. I would do anything for love as he's sipping the Dr. Pepper. And then finally, they're sitting on the couch watching a chick flick, something on the Hallmark Channel, no doubt. And it's like, I would do anything for love. And she takes the can of Dr. Pepper from him so that she can also have a sip. And it says, but I won't do that. And he takes it away and he runs outside. And he's, you know, stomping around. It's like, that's the line. I'll carry your purse. I'll do yoga, I'll go shopping with you, but you're not going to drink a sip from my Dr. Pepper. Now, I mean, there are more Dr. Peppers in America than there are people, but, you know, nonetheless, like, that's his line. We all have a line of where it's like, okay, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. And I want to not think about, like, in terms of, like, a romantic situation, because this isn't a marriage series, but, like, in life... When we talk about the two most important commandments, which is love God, love people, we're supposed to be willing to do anything for love, anything that God has called us to, but where's the line? Where's the, but I won't do that? So in the parable that Jesus tells today, it can be found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 and following. If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn there. In the parable that Jesus tells today, he's questioned by an expert of the law, Essentially, what does love look like when it's like, okay, I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Who's my neighbor? How am I supposed to love them? And Jesus tells a parable called the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a well-known parable. Many people know it. In fact, the, the phrase Good Samaritan has made it as a part of our language, our vernacular as Americans. We have Good Samaritan laws on the books in different states in our country. We have hospitals, one that's close to us named Good Samaritan Hospital. We cannot even begin to fathom, as 21st century Americans, how ridiculous the phrase Good Samaritan would be to a first century Jew, to the audience that Jesus is telling this to for the very first time. The hatred that Jews and Samaritans had for one another, it is difficult for us to describe and comprehend. It would be like if we had a hospital in America called um, the Good ISIS Member Hospital, the Good Jihadist Hospital, the Good Al Qaeda Hospital. Because you'd be like, there's nothing good about like murdering innocent people. So why would we name a hospital after people who do these horrific acts? When you go to Bush Stadium, they have a lot of restaurants and a lot of places you can eat. You wouldn't expect to see a Cubby's Cafe with Cub memorabilia decorate in Bush State, you're like, that's wrong. Or the Cardinal Way Cafe at Wrigley Field. It's like, no, these are rivals. And there's nothing, like, good about your rival. And then, like, in the case of the Jews and Samaritans, they had, like, desecrated each other's temples and destroyed each other's temples at different points in history. It's like they really hated one another. So when Jesus tells a parable about what love looks like and who you're supposed to love, he makes the hero of the story somebody that nobody would have been able to identify with to kind of stretch not only his audiences but by extension our understanding of what real genuine Christian love is supposed to look like so in Luke chapter 10 here's how it jumps in on one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus teacher he asked what must I do to inherit eternal life. So that everything that comes from this dialogue is this expert in the law's desire to test Jesus and somehow trip him up, has somehow to trap him in his words and what he says. He doesn't want to learn anything. He doesn't want to grow spiritually. <laughs> he wants to see if he can somehow trick Jesus into saying something that he can then use against Jesus and make himself look like more of an expert of the law than Jesus is. And even, his, even the nature of his question, what must I do to inherit? Well, inheritances, especially in their culture, 
It was just something that you were given just because of when you were born in terms of like the family. Like, you know, the oldest got twice as much as everyone else, not because they liked the oldest more, but that was the precedent that was set about in their culture. Like, what is your inheritance? Well, this is your inheritance because this is where you're born and my, you know, my slew of offspring. So what do you do? Well, you do something you can't have any, you don't have anything control over. It's like when you're born or who you're born to, that determines your inheritance. So his question is like, well, you don't do anything to get an inheritance. It's just given to you out of like grace and it's a gift and it's just something, there's a precedent that's been set. But in his question, he's trying to figure out what is it I have to do? Who do I have to become? How good do I have to be to be given eternal life? And Jesus answers his question with a question. He says, well, you're an expert in the law. What is written in it? How do you read it? Like, when you read the Bible, what do you think the answer is? So the question that the expert in the law gives to Jesus to test him, he ends up answering the question on behalf of Jesus. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus, at different points in his ministry, he's questioned, hey, what is the greatest commandment? Love God with everything? Love your neighbor as yourself. Of the Old Testament laws, there's 613. There's a lot of laws. They can be summed up in love God, love people, and you can further simplify, and you could just say, just love. Just love. That's it. That's what the law prescribes. That's what the law demands of us. But look at how the, the teacher of the law answers it. Love God with essentially everything. Love God with perfection, and then you need to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it is easier to love God because God is perfect, but none of us love God perfectly. Anytime that you sin, that you have a, 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 a thought where there's ego and pride or you gossip, like anytime you do anything big or small, you are sinning against God and recognizing you don't love God with everything. You've fallen short. And then love your neighbor as yourself. My goodness. Have you met some of your neighbors? Not like literally, but like the people around you that you have to do life with. It's like, man, you know that expression, people be people. And it's like there are some knuckleheaded people out there. Just go to Walmart for 10 minutes and you'll, get to, you'll be introduced to some knuckleheads. So it's like love them like you love yourself. That's a pretty tall order because people are egotistical they have pride and ego, just like you do. They will lie, cheat, steal, murder, do all kinds of atrocities, and you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's like, love God with everything, love your neighbor as yourself. And so after he gives this response, Jesus says, that's it, yeah. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, when you think about, like, well, what about grace, and what about Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world, and, like, that's what's going to get you in, why doesn't Jesus say, well, here's the thing, how do you inherit eternal life? Bad news, you can't do anything to inherit eternal life. Good news, I'm going to do it for you. You're going to get to heaven because of my blood sacrifice. Like, why doesn't Jesus go into that? Well, because the guy came to test him. He's not looking for truth. He's trying to somehow orchestrate an argument and a debate where he makes Jesus look bad. So Jesus pushes it back on him. Well, you've read the law. What does it say? Love God, love people. That's right. You've answered correctly. Go and do likewise. That's what you need to do. Now, when you think about having to do hard things in your life in order to achieve something you greatly desire, like, I just think of, like, basketball conditioning or trying to study for a final test and pass a class that you have to have to get your major or whatever. Like, there are sacrifices you have to make, but there are certain things, and, and for me, it was, like, basketball conditioning. I wanted to play basketball so badly. I loved it so much. There's, like, I would do anything for basketball, but I won't do that. I'll do anything. Like, I would do whatever it took. Well, just imagine, like, okay, if you want to make the team you have to jump over this 15-foot wall. I'd be like, okay, I'm not physically capable of that. Like, I'll do whatever I can, but that's, that's outside my parameter. Like, I can't do it. Is there, like, a ladder? Like, can I jump off of somebody? Is there a trampoline that can be used? Like, is there any 
other way because I can't do that. What Jesus has just said, go and do likewise, if the guy was intellectually honest, he'd be like, okay, I can't do that. I can't love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I can't love my neighbor as myself. And so instead of saying, okay, is there another way, which maybe would have led to a grace conversation, the the guy, the expert of the law, it says he wanted to justify himself, so he asked, well, who is my neighbor? He's trying to find a loophole around this whole thing. Because he's an expert of the law, I just think of him as a lawyer. Just think about lawyers for a second. Lawyers be lawyering. And there's a reason that the iTunes agreement on your software update on your phone is 3,000 pages long. It's because of lawyers. I don't know what it says. If you've read it, you've done more than I have. Maybe I have signed away my mortgage to some Chinese company. I don't know. But it's like, do you agree to all these terms? Because there's like, there's so many loopholes and things that, you you know, it's like, well, because you said this, now I can do this. Like, like the, the fact that we even have lawyers in the justice system like it is, it's like, my goodness gracious, great balls of fire. So he's trying to justify himself. Let me try to think of a loophole here. So it's like, okay, if you want to do this, you got to jump over this 15 foot wall. He's saying, how big of a running start do I get? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who your neighbor is, you're still not going to do it perfectly. Never mind, he said, you got to love God perfectly. So Jesus, instead of saying, well, everybody, he tells the guy a story. And that's where we find one of the most famous parables that Jesus has ever told. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, they would have been familiar with the road that would have been used. It was filled with all different, um, you know, cliff edges and nooks and things that people could easily hide. And you just go walking by unsuspectedly and you could be attacked without even knowing what was about to happen. It was a dangerous area. So they hear the story and they're like, yeah, that's... That's plausible. I've heard of people that that's happened to. And then Jesus says, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So priests, it was an occupation. They were very holy people. They had a two-week stint where they were like on call, on duty. They were supposed to be performing certain tasks around the temple. And then when they got home, they kind of were still responsible for doing different things on behalf of people before God. But in order for a priest to be able to do his work, he had to be considered ceremonially clean. What would make you unclean? Touching a dead body. In fact, they had some rules that said if your shadow touched the dead body, you were considered unclean. And so, like, there's like, okay, there are these rules. And I got, man, I got to go to work. I'm doing God's work. I'm a priest. I'm kind of a big deal. And this guy, I I don't know if he's dead or alive, but but if I try to help him and he dies in the process, or if he's already dead, well, then I'm unclean. I can't do my work. And so he passes by as far away as he can to protect his, his ceremonial cleanliness so that he could go do the work that God's called him to do. Now, the thing about it is, the work that God has called him to do is love God, love people. And if you're going to go burn incense in some building as opposed to save somebody's life, like which do you think takes precedent? But this priest has done, you know, some mental gymnastics. He found a loophole. I'm really important got to do God's work, therefore, I'm not going to help this guy. And he just passes by. The Levite comes along after. The Levites were priests' assistants. Now, we don't know. This is a made-up. Jesus is making up the story. And he's using, like, high-integrity, very respected individuals to say a priest and a Levite didn't stop to help the guy who's dying. And the Levite comes along, and he's, maybe, maybe he's the the priest assistant, he's already passed by. It's like, well, I can't, I can't show up my boss. That wouldn't look good. Like, if I stop to help the guy, it's like, you know, well, you didn't help, but I did because I know more about you than, you know, the Bible and God. And so he just is like, well, if he walked by, maybe I should walk by too. There are so many times where 
we have an opportunity to do the right thing, but we will justify passiveness like, well, this is the good thing, this is the right thing, this is the okay thing to do because of the gymnastics that we see these two guys engage in. It's like we, just as the teacher of the law is trying to justify himself, well, who's my neighbor? And how can I twist that definition to make myself look good and make me feel like I'm appeasing the law? It's like we do this all the time in our lives. And what Jesus says, like, okay, well, if you want to have love, <laughs> it's going to require action it's going to require an inconvenience on your life it's going to require some level of sacrifice it isn't easy but you want to know what loving your neighbor as yourself looks like here's what it looks like but a samaritan as he traveled came to where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him now, the Samaritan had somewhere to be. He wasn't on the road just for a joy ride on his donkey. Some people are like, I'm going to take a Sunday afternoon. They didn't do that, okay? There was no casual travel. It was always dangerous. It was always difficult. He has somewhere that he's going. But <clears throat> he sees a guy on the side of the road, and Jesus says he took pity on him. Because what he did was said, well, if I was laying on the side of the road, and I was, like, half dead, and I was, like, beaten and bruised like what would I want someone to do for me I'd want them to take care of my immediate medical needs take me somewhere and make sure that I receive the care so that I could make it and recover so the Samaritan sees the guy and says that's what I'm going to do now you think about the the different racial ethnic tensions between Jews and Samaritans they're in Jewish territory. They're on the road from Jericho, which is a prominent Jewish city, and Jerusalem, which is the capital of uh, the Jewish nation. So as a Samaritan, he's like, this guy's most likely a Jew. He doesn't know that for sure because he doesn't have any clothing on to, to signify that he's a Jew. He can't hear him talk for his dialect because he's unconscious. But the Samaritan, that doesn't matter. This guy's dying. He needs help. I'm going to help him. So he takes care of his... Immediate medical needs, puts him on a donkey, travels slowly to an inn, stays up with him all night, keeps checking on him, checking his body, like all the things that you would do to make sure that someone's going to make it. And then, to top it off, the next day, he took out two denarii, two days worth of wages, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after them, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses that you may have. He's stable. I'm going to leave him under your care. I've got to go finish some business, but then I'm going to come back, and when I do, I'm going to check on him, and I'll settle up whatever the bill has come to. The Samaritan has gone above and beyond what would have been expected, and the fact that he's a Samaritan is like icing on the cake. So who's my neighbor? Jesus just told a story of... You know, like the enemy of the Jews sacrificing so that someone's life could be saved. And then Jesus puts the question back to him. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Couldn't even bring himself to say, the Samaritan is the hero of the story. And Jesus' response is, you need to go and do likewise. So what that guy did, you should also go and do. When you think about loving your neighbor as yourself, it is a difficult thing to do because we're talking about imperfect people who don't always love you back to the degree that you love them. So if you sacrificially and inconveniently help someone, serve someone in some way, our American minds, it's like, okay, well, if I did this for you, then I should get this as return. But what Jesus is saying is, no, you should love people inconveniently and sacrificially because that's what love your neighbor as yourself means. It's not about what you're going to get in return. This is the life that God has called you to live. Now, when you and I think about it, it becomes a very difficult thing, a very 
tall order. Because it's like, okay, I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love my neighbor as myself. I am failing on both accounts. Does that mean I can't inherit eternal life? God's grace covers your sins. What must you do to inherit eternal life? Embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But then once the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he begins to change you on the inside out. The loving God and loving people is not so that we can receive our salvation, but because we've received salvation. And we now know there's a better way and a different way to live life on this planet. So we are called to live like the Good Samaritan, not to inherit anything, but to live the life that God has called us to live, to be light in darkness. And the thing that we miss so often, because we're Americans, and we're stubborn, and we're so independent. We fought a war that was the, <laughs> over a declaration of independence, Independence Day. So it's like, no, we're about independence, all us, it's all on our own. You cannot do this on your own. When God says... Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's like, you cannot do that. But I can strengthen you so that you can do more than what you could ever possibly do in your natural state. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is teaching, one of the sections he, he gets to is love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you will be sons of my Father in heaven. And in that discussion, he's like, if you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? Don't even the tax collectors and the pagans, and we would say, wouldn't members of ISIS and gang members, don't they take care of their own? Don't they have a brotherhood and a camaraderie within their ranks? Like, if they, they take care of each other... And Jesus is like, if that's all you do as a follower of mine, what more are you doing than the people of the world? The love that Christ has called us to, it's like the basement for the Christian is the ceiling for every other group. The maximum that they're going to do is love the people who love them. Love the people who look like them, talk like them, or are part of their group or part of their gang. That is the max out for them. Jesus says, that's your basement, and that's when Christian love begins. Because from there is when you get inconvenience. From there is when you get sacrifice. When you love people who don't look like you, talk like you, who can't give you anything in return. When you love people who do not love you back, now you're beginning to fill the, fulfill the mission that God has given to you. So like, that's the call that he's placed on our lives. Go and do likewise. But, he says go and do likewise, and then he provides the strength for us to go and do likewise. So if you try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be better at loving God, I'm going to be better at loving others, you may get it right for a season, you do it on your own strength. You've got a little bit of endurance that can help you. But that's going to fall short quickly. And you're going to find yourself going back to your default mode, which is what your sin nature dictates in your life. Through things like Bible study and prayer and memorization on Scripture and meditation on Scripture, through the private spiritual disciplines... God begins to work on your heart and change you on the inside out to give you a different way of thinking about people, a different way of talking to people, treating people. It's like the change for us is always out to in. The change through the Holy Spirit is always in to out. He changes your natural default mode so that you can begin to live and think and talk more like Jesus. It does not come about direct effort, meaning, okay, I want to be more loving, so I want to try to be more loving. No, 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 no. I'm going to get closer to God, and that indirect action will directly make me more loving. When Jesus is teaching to people that are going to start following, he's like, man, my yoke and my burden, they are light and easy to bear. And you read that, and you're like, 
I don't know. I've read, I've read this stuff like love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Just stick on that one. You're like, there's nothing light or easy about loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you. It's because Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't focus on the action. Focus on me and I will strengthen you to live the way that I've called you to live. Whenever you start thinking about this and executing this in your day-to-day life, you prioritize your relationship with God above everything. He begins to spiritually strengthen you to slowly become more like Jesus, become the person he's called you to be. And then you will begin to see opportunities to apply these different teachings in your life. It doesn't have to be some big home run moment Small acts of kindness and love and sacrifice go a long way to a person 